Welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be testing out the portrait selection of professional watercolors by Rembrandt. Inside this set are 12 colors in half pan variety encased in an aluminum tin. As you can see, they're all individually wrapped, and there's actually quite a bit of information on each of the wrappers that may be helpful if you are new to any of the colors in the set. In the top left is the light fastness rating, and the top right is the color number. Also included is the color name in a couple different languages, and then on the back is going to be your pigment numbers. As you unwrap the pan, you'll notice that there is a printed color number on the side, so if it ever needs to be replaced, that's where you can find it, is just right on the edge. And Rembrandt is professional grade watercolor. They use gum arabic as the binder. Also included in the set is this small travel brush, and it's red sable. It's a four round, so it comes to a really nice point. I noticed that there are only two opaque colors in this set, the opaque white and the ivory black. Besides that, all of the colors are basically transparent. There's a couple that are semi-transparent, but this is going to be wonderful if you like to layer and glaze color as I do. Some of these colors are pretty familiar to me, and other than that, it looks like the vermilion could be a good substitute for a cadmium red, and the permanent red violet could be a good substitute for alizarin crimson. But this seems like your pretty standard portrait collection of color. In addition to the basic swatches, I also wanted to make a swatch chart. This is kind of overkill, but I just wanted to show the range of all of the different colors that you can actually mix from this set. Normally when people think portrait collection, It'll just be a lot of browns and pinks, tans and whites, maybe a purple or two. A more advanced set like this gives you an advantage for mixing. All of these colors in this selection are single pigmented except for the yellow ochre and vermilion, which means that you're not going to get a lot of mud, and you'll be able to scale the colors in any direction you need to for your portraits. Color swatch charts can also be very helpful if you need to match a particular color from a reference. You can just look at the swatch chart and see how that color would be mixed. So I put a poll out on my community tab and you guys voted for Lord of the Rings portraits, which is wonderful because I absolutely love Lord of the Rings. It's one of my favorite franchises. So I'm just going to paint some of my favorite characters from the Peter Jackson uh, movies because I wanted to have a um, really solid reference for everybody that I was going to be painting today. So for each of the different portraits, I tried to use just a couple of colors in the palette to create different feelings. So for this portrait of Grimma Wormtongue, for those of you that are not familiar with Lord of the Rings, he is not a very important character, but I always liked his appearance. I think they casted him really well. He's kind of like a cold, sneaky character. So for his portrait, I ended up using Ultramarine Deep, Cerulean Blue, Permanent Red Violet, and Burnt Sienna as my main colors to try to really convey that cold feeling that he has. For all of the portraits, I started off with loose underlayers and just began to tighten up from there. Now, throughout this video, you'll see me flipping my portrait upside down <laughs> and painting on it. This is a trick that one of my professors in um, college taught me, and it's basically to flip your reference photo upside down along with your painting so that you can double check that all of your values and all of your placement and everything is in the right spot. This is extremely helpful especially if you have sketched your reference photo um, and you didn't transfer anything because things can get misaligned really easily. Um, and especially when you're trying to capture a likeness of a person, everything pretty much needs to be in the right spot. So you'll see me doing that throughout the video. I really loved building up my layers with the more opaque white mixed into it. It almost makes it like a gouache painting and it allows you to do lots of layering. When you have a lot of transparent colors, it gives you really clean, simple 
layers and glazes, but that opaque white allows you to cover areas and really build up depth pretty easily. Next up, we have Heir to the Throne of Gondor, King Aragorn himself. And for this one, I kind of used colors that I am most familiar with, that I actually paint oil portraits with, and that's going to be your standard, almost Zorn palette, with yellow ochre, and in this case, vermilion, instead of cad red, which I normally use, burnt sienna, and then we have the permanent red violet, along with the ivory black. And in all of these, I'm using the opaque white as well. So the ivory black, when you think of a black, um, is actually used instead of a blue. It has a cool tint to it, so when you mix colors with the ivory black, you're actually going to get more of a blue hue to them. And it will make some of your more vibrant colors a lot more muted and desaturated. I really enjoyed the gestural colors within the face and the clothing in this piece, and I didn't want to mess around with them too much. However, I was kind of struggling with the eye area, and I felt like something wasn't right, so I just, you know, kept flipping it upside down, right side up, and I couldn't quite figure out what was going on proportion-wise, so instead I did another change of perspective tip that I'd like to share with you. If you are having issues with proportion, I recommend flipping both your reference photo and a photo of your painting horizontally, and this way it just kind of changes your perspective and you're able to notice any major differences between the two. If you focus on the eye area and the left area of the mouth, you can see that my sketch was not very accurate so I'm going to need to fix those two things in my painting. The good news is that I saw a problem and it was only about halfway through, so I'll be able to fix it. Luckily, none of these colors are very staining, so it was pretty easy for me to just scrub it with a wet brush, pick it up, re-sketch it where I want it to go, <laughs> and then um, just plug everything back in. I think it worked out for the best. Yeah, I always like to say, if you're not happy with it, change it. Uh, there's a lot of people I talk to that think that watercolor is kind of a more permanent thing, and it can be, but when you're working with an opaque color, like the opaque white, and your colors don't really stain, and if you're working on a high-quality paper, you can really fix a lot of mistakes pretty easily. Next up, we have one of my favorite ladies from the Lord of the Rings series. Her name is Eowyn, and for her portrait, I tried to use colors that I do not normally use at all when I am painting portraits. So for her selection, I used Ben's Midazolone Orange, Vermilion, Burnt Sienna, Azo Green Yellow, and Thalo Green. And Eowyn has that total like, damsel in distress kind of look to her. She has big eyes, beautiful long blonde hair, but she really is uh, quite the badass lady in this series. So I wanted to do her justice, and for the first half of the painting I was kind of afraid to go as dark on the face as the reference photo, but then I somehow found the confidence and just decided to keep layering it up. For Eowyn's portrait, it was a lot of utilizing the greens plus the reds and the oranges as complementary colors to create a variety of different browns and warm tones against the greens. One of the things you do need to watch out for if you're going to layer watercolors quite a bit, and if they begin to start sitting on top of the paper as opposed to being absorbed down into it, um, you may actually get a little bit of a sheen on the surface of your paper. It's not going to be like gouache where it's more of that matte finish. It'll be a little bit between satin and gloss. So that's what started to happen to me, and I figured um, now is a good time to <laughs> throw in the towel on this one. It's really difficult for me to figure out what level I wanted to finish my sketches to, like, I really enjoy the looseness 
that I normally do, and so for this one, I feel like the areas that I do like, like the background and her clothing and her hair look nice, but overall her face is just a little bit too overworked for my liking. Alright, next up we have everybody's favorite little guy. I'm only painting the most important characters of the series here, and so this is Gollum. For those of you that are not familiar with the series, you've probably seen him around in some way, shape, or form, but he's basically just a little gremlin dude. <laughs> and I had a lot of fun painting him. I kind of went for a different approach on Gollum. I tried to use almost every color in the palette on his painting, and I went for very transparent, really sheer layers of watercolor to build up my color. That way I could get um, some of those beautiful muted grays in there. So you'll see me kind of sloshing around all the colors in the palette um, in the mixing area to mix some of those more muddy tones. And as I went through the painting, I just refined the couple areas that I wanted the attention to go on. So overall, I left that one a little bit more loose. Last up, we have Gandalf. For Gandalf, I wanted his portrait to be very tight, so I ended up working on his quite a bit. I also failed myself during the sketch portion. I unfortunately did not spend enough time on the sketch and I paid for it. <laughs> I, As I was painting I was like this doesn't look right and so again I had to move one of the eyes over and I wanted to share one of the ways that I've figured out how to figure out what's wrong with my sketch as I'm going. What I'll do is I'll take a photo of my painting and on my phone I'll just change it to grayscale. I like the mono setting for this and then I'll just crop it in, and I'll do the same with my reference photo where I'll switch it to grayscale, and that way I'm able to just see the actual um, contrast tones of the piece, and I'll be able to compare the two together, and you may be able to see different things you didn't see while they were both in color. So about halfway through the painting, or especially if I'm struggling with it, I will do this technique, and I will search for negative shapes or just main differences in value. I wanted to give an overall summary of my thoughts on the palette as we finish painting up Gandalf. I think that this is a really great palette for painting different portraits in different instances. If you're new to painting portraits, I recommend just choosing five colors or so from the palette at a time. I think that the color selection in this palette is very intuitive because it has a warm and cool of each of the colors, so if you know that the nose needs a little bit more red but you're not sure which one, you can kind of look at both of the reds in the palette and figure out which one you need for that situation. So if you're a beginner to portrait painting, instead of buying a palette that has a bunch of pre-mixed skin tones, check out a palette like this, or just a color, couple of colors from a palette like this, because you'll be able to learn how to mix your own skin tones, and your paintings will be a lot more dynamic. Then you can also apply your mixing skills to other types of painting besides just portraits. So overall, I had a lot of fun painting these today, and I hope that you guys enjoyed them and learned a thing or two. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch the video, and I hope you have a wonderful week.